Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Craddock and I'm a partner at Eaton Bridge Partners. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon with David Smith, the economics editor of the Sunday Times. Before I hand over to David, just a brief introduction for those of you who don't know Eaton Bridge Partners. We are an award-winning executive search, interim management and consultancy business recruiting across the breadth of corporate leadership. Geographically, we recruit across UK, Europe, and increasingly globally. Um, relationships and delivery are at the heart of all that we do. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've had a very strong year in terms of our performance as a business. We continue to grow, and we have so far seen no signs of any slowdowns in the market. So I'm gonna hand over to David now, and hopefully David is gonna tell us that all the economic forecasts are wrong, and the economy is about to boom. So David, I will hand over to you for your half an hour presentation, and then we'll do questions after that. Over to you, David. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark. That's, uh, that's very good news. I've, um, I seem to have um, gone off uh, uh, picture there. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things about um, the reopening of the economy and so on is that uh, even the skills you learned quite recently can be easily forgotten. So I'm, um, I'm not as sharp on Zoom as I was at one stage, probably was never that sharp. But uh, anyway, uh, it's great, a great pleasure to be here. And uh, what I'd like to do is, um, is go through my uh, presentation now, and then uh, we can have a discussion afterwards. And very good news that uh, you're doing so well, Mark. Um, it's not true of everybody, I don't think, but, um, but every, um, every bit of the economy that is performing well counts. And um, I think the message I'm gonna um, give today, uh, I don't want anybody switching off at this point, is um, that perhaps it's important not to be too gloomy at the moment, even though there's a lot of gloom around. So uh, let, me, um, let me run through what I, what I want to say. So what is in prospect amid the uncertainty? Obviously the uncertainty that we've seen in recent times has been extraordinary. And um, we had the uncertainty of the, uh, of the pandemic. We've had the uncertainty of the uh, cost of living crisis in Russia, Ukraine, these geopolitical uncertainties. And then the added UK specific uncertainty of that, um, that September the 23rd uh, mini budget. And I, I think the, um, you know, that period uh, of a few weeks from early September onwards, you know, which which included, of course, the sad death of the Queen. So that was unsettling. That, re that removed a kind of, um, you know, a norm for most people. Um, was was really, and then we had the September the twenty third mini budget. So massive, you know, UK focused uncertainty in addition to all the other uncertainties that we've uh, we've become uh, used to. And so, in the in um, that context, what I want to try and do is is answer three questions. It's always a little bit easier to try and answer questions that you've set yourself. So the, the three are, you know, can we continue to have an economic recovery? Can things continue to be um, as, as good as uh, Marx as they are for Eaton Bridge? Or um, is there a recession baked in and inevitable? Inflation, you will know that we had figures today showing inflation at 11.1%, highest for uh, more than 40 years, uh, something that not many people would have expected uh, a year or so ago. How long will that uh, high inflation last? And also within that, uh, how much will interest rates rise? We've already seen a big uh, sustained rise in interest rates from the Bank of England. We've seen interest rates rise in the, uh, in the markets as well, mortgage rates going up and so on. So how much will they go up? When might they start to uh, come down again? So those three questions, let me try and answer them before uh, taking some of your questions. Um, so what's caused this, uh, this trouble that we've got at the moment. Of course, the immediate uh, problem is the huge energy price shock. I mean, I can't remember in the many years I've been doing this, this kind of thing, uh, this kind of job, ever really focusing on gas prices before. You know, there have been periods where uh, gas has been in, uh, not necessarily short supply, but, um, but there have been problems with gas supply, but never on the scale that we've seen now. When we've talked about energy price shocks in the past, it's always been about oil. Uh, rather than um, rather than gas, so the gas price is very important. That's the source of the shock that we're seeing at the moment. Labour shortages, uh, you know, the new prime minister, the former chancellor, you know, when Rishi Sunak was uh, was um, chancellor, I spoke to him a lot, and uh, you'll remember very well, I, I, I'm sure, his launch of the furlough scheme and the operation of the furlough scheme, 
I remember talking to him around about that, and the, you know, his his ambition was that um, through the furlough scheme, through keeping people tied to their employer, you could stop unemployment going up too much. But I don't think he ever expected us to emerge from the pandemic with the kind of labour shortages that we're seeing at the moment, which have have their roots, of course, in a big reduction in the size of the workforce compared with what we might have expected. Some of that is due to um, uh, fewer EU workers. Most of it is due to domestic factors, including people principally from the age of 50 onwards leaving the workforce, either because of ill health or for early retirement reasons. And also, you know, at the other end of the scale, you know, students who tended to take on part time jobs before the pandemic and then had their education and their social life interrupted, maybe are no longer as keen to do so. Supply chain difficulties, you know, those, you know, we go back two and a half years and those were thought to be the main economic um, damage that would be caused by the pandemic because we saw all these problems in, uh, in China. Um, but now, uh, you know, we're, we're still seeing supply chain difficulties. They, they do seem to be easing, but we've had those for the last couple of years. And as I'll come on to, central banks are tightening policies, so interest rates are going up. Um, and this is like, you know, the famous black swan, um, you know, all swans are white until people discovered black swans in, uh, in Australia. So a black swan has become the, um, you know, the, the shorthand for, a, um, for an economic shock. These um, on the screen are, are genuine black swans. They are from um, Winston Churchill's um, uh, former home at Chartwell in Kent. I don't know whether anybody's ever been there, but uh, it's worth a visit. Uh, I've got no, I don't, I don't get any commission from the National Trust for saying that, but um, he's, there are black swans there, quite magnificent creatures. But the, the black swans we tend to talk about are the, are the, the shocks that we've faced, and we've had to, uh, had to deal with in recent years. Now, if you look at the, um, the economy as a whole, Broadish measure of economic activity, of course, is GDP, gross domestic product. We now have that on a monthly basis. And um, the one outstanding thing from, the, um, from the, the last couple of years has been, firstly, how far the economy fell when we had, particularly when we had the first lockdown. So the first lockdown announced on March 23rd, 2020, followed by this precipitous fall in economic activity in the second quarter of, uh, of that year. And um, just to put that fall in perspective, you know, the, the fall in that second quarter really determined the fact that we had a recession because GDP fell by just under 20%, 19.5%, which was off the scale in, in compared with um, previous recessions. So the, the previous biggest quarterly fall was just 2.8% in the three-day week of 1974. So to see a fall like that, um, because, you know, if you think back to that time, and it's quite difficult to think back to that time now, None of us really knew what to do. We we're all, I'm sure, pretty worried about this um, this uh, virus, but also, you know, lots of things were closed down. Uh, you know that, that uh, you know people people were encouraged, almost ordered to work at home. Um, Non-essential retailing, even things that weren't required to close, tended to close in that first couple of months, like building sites and factories and so on, as safety procedures were, were put in place. But the, the thing about that period, which could have been devastating for the economy, you know, that was, you know, the one reason why Rishi Sunak didn't expect labour shortages was, was that there were lots of predictions around that time that the, the lockdown would produce an instant rise in unemployment to three or four million to perhaps 14% of the workforce. That didn't happen. And as you can see from this chart, we had lockdowns two and three, and we got better at handling them. You know, we learned to do the kind of thing we're doing now using uh, Zoom and so on. And people got used to, we adapted, you know, uh, human beings are great at adapting, we, we adapted, but the recession came and went because of this, because you knew that when restrictions were lifted, economic activity would come back again. So it's a, a, essentially a two year recession. We're not quite back to where we were pre, um, pre COVID, but we're almost there. And um, that compares with a normal recession, which takes three years to get back to where you were and the financial crisis recession, which took five years. So, so we got back pretty quickly. But I think now we're into sort of tougher times because this was supposed to be the um, the period in which we would grow our way out of uh, out of the problems of the pandemic, and uh, it was why you know the reason we've got an autumn statement tomorrow was that um, the the task of repairing the public finances after the pandemic had pretty much been done ahead of this this summer's Conservative leadership contest, 
Now we're into another repair job, which is to repair the public finances uh, in response to the damage from these cost of living crisis from the effects mainly of Russia, Ukraine. So this is a um, this is the new challenge. And if you look at uh, you know some components of that, this is a measure of consumer confidence. Um, it's uh, it's done by a company called GFK. It goes back to 1974. For a long time, this was uh, funded by the European Commission, but it's now funded elsewhere for obvious reasons. But um, it goes back a long way through through many testing periods for the economy. You know, it goes back to the time when in the mid 70s, we saw inflation at almost 27%, the 80s when we saw um, uh, unemployment at more than 3 million, um, the financial crisis when you know, it seemed that the banks were collapsing around our ears and the pandemic. And consumer confidence over the past couple of months has been weaker than at any of those times. So consumers are really downbeat at the moment. If the, how you measure consumer confidence, you ask people for their, what their expectations are for the economy, but also what their expectations are for their own personal finances and whether this is a good time to make major purchases. And all those things are, are pretty depressed at the moment. I think they, you know, is it, is it right that people can be gloomier than any, than any time over the past 50 years? Um, I think there is an element of disappointed expectations here that, as I say, you know, we, we thought this might be the sunlit uplands after the pandemic. People have had a tough couple of years. They, you know, this was the time when they, they wanted to, um, they wanted to go on holiday. They wanted to, um, wanted to spend a bit. They wanted to use some of those savings they built up during the uh, the pandemic and then they're hit with a cost of living crisis so there's there's disappointed expectations built into this i think so that is that is certainly a, uh, a factor but also businesses which may also have disappointed expectations are also a bit uh, quite downbeat at the moment this is you know this is not great for them either so business confidence on this measure you know pretty much as low as it was during the pandemic so things are uh, things are not looking good from a business perspective either so Consumer confidence low, business confidence low. Uh, what did we see in response to that? You know, that, you know, that short-lived um, uh, premiership from, um, from Liz Truss. I mean, one of the things she did announce, which was significant, was this two-year energy price freeze. You know, that, that once we got to October, when the average energy bill for a household, you know, many people listen to this, say, well, well, I pay a lot more than the average, which is two and a half thousand. Um, that was to be kept to for two years uh, under the initial plan, and um, and that was you know that was at a time when there were real worries about what would happen over the um, over the winter and uh, and into next year. So the effect of that energy price freeze was to to take away a lot of the pain from households and to a certain extent from businesses and put it onto the public finances, put it onto government debt. But and we saw you can see the effect of that here. You know, this is um, it's quite confusing because the energy price cap is the, actually the price set by the um, uh, by Ofgem, the regulator. But that, that is the red line on here. And what that tells us is what expectations were in terms of where average household bills would, would, would be going. So, you know, getting to, you know, maybe more than uh, 5000 a year by uh, by uh, January. Uh, a little bit down maybe in April, but staying very high over the next couple of years, instead of which we would have had this picture of um, a flat energy price and something similar probably for businesses over that period. So essentially taking away a lot of the pain and that could have been, you know, that was a bit of a game changer. So many economists who were predicting recession before that was announced then removed those predictions of recession because this, as I say, transferred the pain from Households and businesses to um, uh, to the government, um, but now of course we've had we've got a new prime minister, and things have changed again. So the uh, the picture is different to, from what it was before. And the September the twenty third mini budget, which I uh, mentioned, has been almost completely junked. A couple of things which are still in place: the national insurance not going up. Uh, you know the health and social care levy. National insurance did go up briefly, has been cut again. And, um, you know, so that, that's not being reinstated, that increase in national insurance. Uh, there's a stamp duty cut, which has not, uh, has not been reversed either, but everything else pretty much has gone. So corporation tax is still going up uh, in April. 
uh, there was going to be a penny off the basic rate of income tax. That's gone. All these other things down the bottom, including IR35 reforms, but also crucially and most importantly, that energy price freeze is only going to last until April. And then after that, we'll get more targeted support for energy bills. And that is a that is a big change compared with the expensive, uh, but you know, important measure that uh, that Truss announced when she was prime minister. That will make a difference. So, come April, you know, people will will no longer still most people will no longer still be on an average household energy bill of two and a half thousand. It will go up again. May not go up as much as was feared at one time, but it will certainly certainly go up. So, so that changes the um, the picture uh, somewhat. Um, so that and the, the effect of this, of course, has it, it's been to do what is necessary. I mean. After that September the 23rd mini budget, we saw the kind of reaction on financial markets that I've never seen anything close to in all the years I've been doing this job. I've never seen anything close to the kind of panic that ensued from a government announcement. Sometimes you see, you know, I've seen runs on the pound. I've seen periods where, you know, the Bank of England has had to raise interest rates, but the kind of panic that we saw after the September the 23rd mini budget was off the scale in terms of previous experience. Sterling fell to an all-time low against the dollar. Gilt yields just, just moved dramatically higher, pushing mortgage rates up. Expectations were that Bank of England would have to raise rates incredibly sharply to undo the damage. So, um, so the, the, and most of that has been calmed down now. But the, the price of that is that the economic outlook, I think, is a bit more uncertain. Uh, than it was. The good news is that um, if we're going into a downturn, uh, as we probably are, unemployment is very low at the starting point. So um, it's not as though, you know, so none of those fears about high unemployment as a result of the pandemic have been uh, have been proved. The unemployment rate is around about three and a half percent, lowest since the uh, early 70s. And, um, and one, one reason for that is that we've got a smaller workforce. But it's it still means that um, we um, you know we people even though consumer confidence is low, what you don't see particularly is that people are worried about their jobs or if they, if you know we can, we're seeing some redundancies come through now, but most people would be I think reasonably confident they'll find another job because the labour market is so tight at the moment. So so low unemployment is good. Vacancies have just started to edge down a little bit, but are still incredibly strong compared with where we've been in recent years. And as I always say at this point, you know, it's, it's, it's probably easier and cheaper to post uh, job ads um, online, you know, these days because you can do it online. Um, I still have great nostalgia for the, for the days when executive appointments had to be advertised in the Sunday Times and um, probably at great expense, I don't know. Uh, but, um, but it was, uh, you know, that was a real min money spinner for the Sunday Times. We used to run large sections, 24 or 28, or sometimes 40 page appointment sections because there was, there was so recruitment advertising was done in that way. It's easier to post online, but there's no denying the underlying strength of vacancies in the economy and recruitment difficulties for businesses that, uh, you know, there are more vacancies than there are unemployed people. So. The, uh, the job market is tight. And that, that will also, that, I think that's an important offset to some of the gloom that we're seeing at the moment. So, um, uh, and of course, you know, we'll get more detail tomorrow, but um, we've had higher interest rates and the, the bank is raising rates, even though it thinks the economy is gonna go into a long recession. Tax hikes are gonna to come tomorrow. We've been assured by the chancellor, spending cuts will also come tomorrow. I think on both of those things, my sense is that um, there's not going to be changes in tax rates. You know, this is not going to be like George Osborne in 2010 announcing a rise in VAT. I think the tax, the extra tax we'll pay, will be a kind of kind of slow burn tax increases from, for example, freezing income tax allowances and thresholds, maybe bringing down the uh, the point at which uh, the 45p rate kicks in. So you know, a few weeks ago. People who pay the additional rate, the 45% rate, could look forward to its abolition. Now they may be paying it at 125, start paying it 125,000 rather than 150,000. So the big change there. Similarly with the spending cuts, I, you know, I think they're keen to avoid, you know, austerity 2.0. So I don't, you know, these will be of the nature of, 
you know, gradual changes over the period of, of the next five years rather than an immediate sharp hit to spending. But the headlines, I don't think, will be particularly cheerful that we get uh, on Friday morning uh, in response to this. Um, so we do need these lower gas prices. I mean, gas prices have come down, energy price spikes, as I'll mention in a minute, tend not to last that long, but they're still, as you can see from this chart, much higher than we've been used to over a very long period of time, which is one reason why, you know, having ignored the gas price forever, we haven't to take notice of it now, it is driving this energy cr uh, crisis. And for the government's sake, and for everybody else's sake, we just have to hope that the, um, the spike is over and the gas prices will trend even lower uh, as we move through um, uh, next year. Uh, and I don't think that's an unreasonable hope. So um, what, are we, what, should, what should we think of as the outlook? I think, you know, the, the consensus is, um, is that there will be a, um, a recession, but that consensus, I think, uh, you know, depends how gloomy you want to be. But I would say that um, most economists, and I would include myself among this, is that the recession that we'll see is going to be a kind of mild technical version. You know, you, one of the definitions of recession is two consecutive quarters of falling GDP. We might go, get slightly more than two quarters, but I think it will feel more like flatlining as opposed to, it certainly won't be anything on the scale of the pandemic recession or the financial crisis recession. We're talking about a fairly mild cyclical downturn here. And I think some people, depending on what sector you're in, some people will notice it a lot. Some people will not notice it at all. Uh, so I think it will feel more like a flatlining economy over the next 12 to 18 months rather than one that's in a, a big recession. Uh, and similarly for the housing market, lots of predictions about a crash in house prices at the moment. I think we'll see a small correction of the order of 5% rather than a, you know, the kind of 20 to 30% uh, crash that people are, uh, some people are talking about. So if that is cheerful, I'm perhaps more cheerful than uh, the average, more cheerful than the Bank of England, and I suspect, I suspect more cheerful than the OBR, the official forecaster, will be uh, tomorrow. Um, and I think I might be more cheerful slightly on inflation because, of course, we had the figures this morning which were pretty alarming. You know, most people thought that inflation, the, the, high, the highest number we'd get would be slightly below 11%, it's slightly above there. There's a good chance that the latest inflation figure that we had uh, today will represent the peak, but it's still a pretty high peak, you know, 11.1% higher inflation for lower income households, which tend to use, you know, spend more on energy and, uh, and food, you know, food price inflation, which is in the mid to high teens is alarming at the moment, you know, so we, we're seeing big increases in essentials. These are not prices that people can easily avoid, you know. So it's a, it's a very painful inflation that we're we're seeing at the moment. It is the case that the Bank of England, you know, and many others thought it would be higher than. So if 11.1% is the peak, the Bank of England thought it would be nearer to 14%, um, as you can see, uh, as you can see here. And many other other people thought that you know you could almost choose any number depending on what. Uh, energy price or gas price you use for the peak in inflation that we might get uh, over the winter. So the predictions of 15, 18, 22 percent for the peak. So, you know, comparatively speaking, 11 um, percent is, is not as bad as it might have been. And the, the light blue uh, segment there in this chart is just the contribution of energy to the, the inflation we're seeing. You take away energy and um, inflation is still, you know, too high for comfort. It's, it's you know it's six percent or so rather than two percent. But you know we you only get into double figures because of the energy price shock that we've uh, we've seen. Um, but and as I say, the, we, the reason we didn't get to 13, 15, or eighteen is because of the energy price freeze that uh, what the what the government has announced and what the what the new prime minister has retained until until April. So you know don't bother with the detail of this. But the fact is that. Um, you know, we would we would be paying a lot more now for uh, for energy if the um, if the cap had not if the freeze had not been put in place. I mean, paying even more in um, in January on the basis that this the uh, the prices are allowed to change every every three months. So we've dodged a little bit of a bullet as a result of the energy price freeze. 
but uh, as I say, the hope has to be that um, uh, that uh, uh, prices, gas prices, come back down again after this winter. And the reasons they might is because what we're seeing is, uh, you know, quite a response in terms of consumption, particularly in continental Europe. That um, you know we're seeing um, uh, energy consumption fall as a result of energy saving measures. You know, people are being encouraged to turn down their thermostats public in public buildings. They are um, they're doing that as well. You know, one of the th I mentioned the three day week in the three day week in 1974 in this country, you know, shops were not allowed to um, to keep their lights on in their windows at night and things like that. They're doing a lot of those those kind of things in continental Europe at the moment. Not much, not so much here. You could argue that we need to do that here. You know, you, you may ask, why are we being hit so hard by these gas prices when uh, we don't we never bought much from Russia? The reason is that, you know, it's the international price that matters. and the UK happens to be an economy which almost runs on gas, you know, more so than other countries. So roughly 45% of our primary energy comes from gas in the UK, compared with, you know, something just over 20% in most other European countries. The, the dash for gas that we did a few years ago means that we are quite vulnerable to high gas prices. So we, we, have, we have, a even though we don't get much from Russia, we have a uh, uh, you know, a hope that they come down again because it is if they are high gas prices are certainly a big problem for us. Um, so why should inflation come down? Well, you know, energy price spikes don't last very long. We've seen them before. You know, 2008, the oil price got $147 a barrel before subsiding quite quickly. And same thing, similar thing happened in 2011. Similar thing I think will happen with gas this time. It's complicated by the fact that um, gas has become a weapon of war for uh, for Russia and for, for Vladimir Putin, but I still think the basic economics of this uh, do 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 still count. And energy prices, gas prices will come down. We are seeing labour shortages. I was talking to Mark about you know what's happening in terms of salaries, you know, to recruit and retain, but and obviously people are having to pay more to uh, to recruit, but and it, it, that tends to be the time, as everybody listening to this will know, when you uh, when you can generate your biggest pay increases when you change jobs, but um, I'm not encouraging everybody to change jobs this afternoon. But um, but you know overall, wages and salaries are the pay settlements have been averaging four percent for the last uh, five quarters. Average earnings are rising by uh, you know roughly six percent, which is well below eleven percent inflation. Uh, so we're not seeing the kind of wage price spiral that we didn't we saw in the past. You know, you go back to the mid 70s when inflation peaked at nearly 27 percent. That year we saw wages and salaries rise by 30 percent. Nothing like that is happening now. So that means that high inflation is not becoming embedded in the system. And, you know, when the pandemic struck, central banks, including the Bank of England, did a big expansion of QE, quantitative easing, and that boosted the money supply. And, and some people will say that that contributed to the inflation we've seen. But that big money supply expansion is now over. Central banks are replacing quantitative easing with quantitative tightening. They're selling back some of the stuff they bought during that period. So again, that should tell us that inflation should come down. And you see that in the Bank of England's forecast. I mean, the Bank of England may be talking its own book here, but it expects, and I expect, that inflation will be below, back below 5% in the second half of next year. And should be down to something close to the 2% target in, uh, you know, in maybe three years time. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a painful episode, but it's one that, um, that I think we'll get through. I mean, I should say at this point, you know, that you can, inflation can fall, even if, as you, as you will know, even if prices don't fall. So say, for example, we get to a 3000 pound average energy, um, household energy bill next, um, next April, and it was to stay there then inflation comes down because it's not increasing, but it still might be quite painful if it was to stay there. So we, you know, I think we shouldn't underestimate that, that fact that once prices have ratcheted higher, and you can see that for a range of things now, a lot of goods price inflation that we're seeing, uh, you, um, they don't necessarily come down again. You know, inflation may ease, but prices don't necessarily ease. So, so it, take, it takes some time to adjust to these higher prices, I think, for all of us. Um, what about interest rates? The, um, I've, I'm channeling Sherlock Holmes here by talking about the dog that, that initially didn't bark, but has been barking a lot recently. That is a real dog. Um, uh, he does bark quite a lot. 
Uh, and so we've seen a succession of interest rate increases, eight in a row since December last year, taking rates up to uh, 3%, bank rate up to 3%. And, um, and that's the highest we've seen in, uh, in 14 years. And, and also, you know, the, um, you know, the, the suddenness, the, 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 uh, the steps that the bank has been taking have got bigger. So um, the Bank of England was made independent uh, 25 years ago. And in all that time until the last couple of months, it had only ever raised rates by a quarter point at a time. Uh, the, then it did two 50 basis point, two half point raise, uh, uh, hikes in a row. And the latest, as you will know, um, this month was three quarters of a point. So does that mean it is getting more aggressive, more worried? Or does it just mean that uh, it wanted to get to its destination a little bit more quickly? And I think it is the um, I think it is the latter. I don't think that tells us that, that you know, they're, they're, they've been panicked into um, into moving to very high interest rates of the sort we might have been used to in the past. These, you know, the rates we've got now, even three percent is something that many people will not have been used to. I mean, if you, take, you take the period from, uh, you know, March 2009 to, through to just a few months ago. And in that entire period, we hadn't seen a, an official interest rate above three quarters of a, a percent in, um, in the UK. And now we've had an increase of that amount in, uh, in one, one go, and the, the rate is four, four times that of 3%. So what's going to happen? Well, my view on this is that um, you know markets in the panic that ensued after um, September the 23rd mini budget, they were um, you know markets were discounting a rise in bank rate to six or even seven percent, um, which would take us back really into the kind of rates we were used to before the financial crisis. Um, they've calmed down a bit, and you know lots of things have calmed down, but I think markets still expect uh, a peak of perhaps around four and three quarter, maybe 5%. Um, I think the peak will be lower than that. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we won't get to more than 4%. Uh, two reasons for that. One is that um, the, uh, you know, if, if you believe the Bank of England's forecasts, then you don't need 5% or even four and three quarter percent interest rates to get to the inflation that they want to see in a couple of years time. But also, you know, the reason they intervened in the, in the, government bond market in the gilt market in uh, in September, late September and October was because of financial stability concerns. And you get a lot, you know, if, if they're concerned about financial stability, you don't want to crash the economy or the housing market or the commercial property market by raising rates too much. And I think, you know, raising them to 5% would be too much. So that's the reason why I think they will, um, they will peak uh, at a, lo a lower level than that. I mean, 4% will still be quite uncomfortable for for many people, but it's lower than we've been used to, uh, you know, in, uh, in throughout history. You know, many people will remember interest rates of well above 10%. Uh, and also, I think there will be the prospect once we get there that the next move will be downwards and that, you know, what financial markets would call the pivot to lower rates might not be that long away. I think we could see that pivot start to come through, you know, uh, during during next year. So. I don't think we should be too gloomy about um, about interest rates. Um, and just finally, as I always do, I must update you on my skip index. This is my own proprietary and favorite economic indicator. And for those who have never uh, experienced it or never suffered it before, I'll just explain it very briefly. It's based on the number of builder skips in my street. Um, when there are uh, none at all, we're in recession or there's no growth. When there are two, the economy is growing in line with what economists would call trend growth. And when they're four, it's an unsustainable boom. And uh, I can tell you that the, the pandemic played havoc with the skip index. When, when the pandemic first broke, nobody wanted a builder anywhere near the house. So, the, um, so the, the, there were no skips in the street. And even using my reserve powers as statistician, counting two hippo bags as one skip, I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a reading on the skip index. And then everybody decided that, um, they were going to be working from home forever. So everybody wanted a, to build a, a home office in the garden or, or have the loft converted into, into such an office. And uh, at times, I have to tell you, I got a bit worried. There were more than four skips in the street. Then things settled down. And uh, a few days ago, I did a count and there was one skip in the street. So I thought, you know, the economy is just gracefully declining into a, a period of flatlining. But then um, just the other day, my, my neighbor had a skip delivered. So we're back up to two again. So, so maybe it tells us 
a bit like what Mark was saying about Eaton Bridge, that um, the things are holding up a bit better than we, uh, we fear, despite all the gloom and despite all the worries. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Hi, David. We're just trying to get the video to work. Hopefully you can now see and hear me OK. Thank you so much for the, the talk and presentation. Fascinating as always. We've had lots of questions submitted before today and people are sending questions live on the chat box. So I would encourage anyone listening and watching to continue sending in questions. Um, we'll try and cover as many as we can before finishing up promptly at um, 2 p.m. Um, Question, um, a lot of people have been writing in asking about Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, saying that Kwasi Kwarteng obviously has a PhD in economics. He was business secretary. Liz Truss was foreign secretary. She became prime minister. How, how could they have got it so wrong? How could they have misread the markets so, so badly, particularly when Rishi Sunak over the summer was warning them that this would happen? Yeah, it's a very good question because I, I think the... Um... I heard about the, um, uh, the some of the elements of the um, of the mini budget, but I think on the Tuesday evening before the Friday of the announcement, and it included the um, you know getting rid of the forty five uh, percent uh, additional rate, top rate, scrapping the cap on bankers bonuses, doing a few other things. And somebody described it to me who, who knew quite a lot of the detail. Uh, you know they are going for broke on this, and both of us concluded a that this that would go down like a lead balloon with voters and b would go down like a lead balloon in uh, in financial markets and i think i think what they what they thought was that um you can't do anything more for the city of london than get rid of the 45 percent top rate and remove the cap on bankers bonuses so this is going to be a this is going to be celebrated in the financial markets and, and they were the only people to think that i think that uh, you know um quasi had worked in a hedge fund Probably spoken to a few of his hedge fund mates about how would how would how would you think of this? And I think they would all have said, as with the, all the conservative donors, you know, this is great stuff. At the same time, that the hedge funds were shorting the pound because they knew how badly it would go down in the market. So I think they got it wrong. And I think it, you know, then the question becomes, why didn't um, why didn't the treasury warn them? I think the treasury was slightly um, scared off because uh, you know one of the first things that. Um, Kwasi Kwarteng did on, when becoming chancellor was sack the most senior official in the treasury, Sir Tom Scholar, the permanent secretary. I think when something like that has happened, everybody else is a bit wary of kind of challenging the uh, the new guy, the new person who's come in and saying, are you sure this is wise chancellor? So I think that, that overcame that. The Bank of England uh, has said subsequently it wasn't aware of any of it. It wasn't consulted on any of it. So I think that, I think that's how it happened. They just got carried away, you know. They thought um, this is going, you know, we we you have one chance to make an impact, and that's when you take over. So they wanted to do everything at once, and and they didn't realise the consequences. Thank you, David. And I suppose a follow up question to that: um, with with trust and Kwarteng, it proves having the wrong people in office has a has a serious consequence. Do you feel that with Andrew Bailey at the Bank of England, Rishi Sunak, and Jeremy Hunt as the new Chancellor? We've got the right people in place to navigate us through this. That's a good question. Yeah, I, I think it does. I mean, you know, for, for one of the co most common complaints you get from um, politicians is that um, nothing they do seems to make a difference. And we, we saw that, you know, completely disproved with uh, with um, Quasi Kwarteng's uh, mini budget. You know, it made a huge difference in the wrong way. Um, I think you know Andrew Bailey has a lot of critics because I don't think he is as um, as fluent a presenter as um, as either of his predecessors, either um, Mark Carney or um, or Mervyn King. But I think he is quite a safe pair of hands. Jeremy Hunt, who was appointed by Liz Truss, of course, not Rishi Sunak. Um, he's um, you know he's proved himself to be quite a safe pair of hands. You know, not afraid even when she was still. In office to reverse most of that uh, that mini budget. Um, uh, Rishi Sunak, you know, was a good a good chancellor during the pandemic when um, when it was all about giving money away. I think I, you know whether he can keep that going during the uh, during tough times when he has to say no. I think he probably will. The, the, I think the, the slight danger we've got at the moment is you've got two chancellors um, uh, running the country, and uh, you know 
much though I love the Treasury, much though I love Chancellor of the Exchequer, I think you can have too many of them. Interesting. OK. Um, and again, a question we've had here, and just as you mentioned then, that um, perhaps Truss and Kwarteng haven't spoken to the Bank of England. A question here saying, do you think that our government is talking to other governments um, as often and as effectively as they should be doing? Well, certainly not in that period, because, uh, I mean, you saw, um, you know, people were just in other countries, including, and some of them went public on it, were just aghast at what happened in that in September the 23rd mini budget. And there was clearly no prior consultation about that. I think Rishi Sunak will talk quite a lot to people because I, I, I think he, uh, to other countries, because I think he needs it really, you know, the more interaction he gets with, um, with other leaders. And he, he clearly has a rapport with, with some of the younger ones, you know, like, um, like uh, Macron in France and uh, Justin Trudeau, you know, they, they're, they're all kind of youngish sort of snappy dressing uh, politicians, as opposed to some of the old stages. I, if, if uh, Donald Trump ever made a comeback, I don't think, um, I don't think uh, Richie Senate would necessarily have the kind of rapport with him that um, Boris Johnson did. I think he'd probably get on all right with um, with Biden, but he would regard him as a as you know a father, if not a grandfather figure. So uh, so I think it's going to be quite interesting. But I, I think he needs that because he's got no foreign policy experience. So it was sensible in the end for him to go to the COP27 talks. It's sensible for him to be in Indonesia for the G20 because he he needs to get get to know these people and to learn from their experience. I think so. So I think there will be more. There will be closer consultation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, David. And following on then from your uh, mentioning COP, uh, the COP conference, a question here we've had from Sonali Samani um, from IWG, um, Sonali's head of ESG. How do you think sustainability and climate change will impact economics going forward? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good question. I, I, most, um, you know, most people, I, I think we, we're, getting, we're getting into a kind of situation um, just a few weeks ago when um, you know the people were saying you know well we wouldn't be in this in this difficulty if we um, if we hadn't if we weren't so if we weren't pursuing net zero and I, I think I think you know common sense has prevailed and uh, and we realize that's not the case and, and the, you know the one way to get yourself out of this these kind of problems is to um, is to invest more in renewables and so on and um, you know there was there was a a story that appeared briefly um, uh, a few weeks ago, which was that they were they weren't going to go ahead with the Sizewell C uh, nuclear power station, and the BBC ran with it quite strongly. It was then very quickly denied, and I'm glad it was denied because it seemed totally illogical. If you're pursuing a net zero uh, strategy, then nuclear has to be part of that. I think we're still quite, and and what we've seen from the new prime minister, of course, is that. Um, you know the fracking ban has been reinstated, but I um, I think we're still a little bit sort of um, uh, overcautious about things like onshore wind and so on when when it comes to this. People who look at these things, and uh, I'm sure your uh, questioner would 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 agree with this that you can that you know you don't have to sacrifice growth to get um, to get net zero. You know you don't have to, and you don't have to sort of stop cars on the M25 or um, or throw oil over paintings or paint over the Bank of England to, to, to get that message across. I think it's, um, you can achieve uh, net zero alongside economic growth. And, you know, one of the things that I suppose has gone away slightly because we've got such a tight labor market was that those kind of green new deal ideas were part of those were, you know, let's, yeah, let's insulate homes a lot better. We're very poorly insulated homes in the UK. That would have generated a lot of jobs. So we could have done something with that, you know, these days when the labor market's tight we no longer no, no longer need that as an absorber of of people of spare uh, of spare uh, labor as it were but uh, but i think i think we can still we can still move uh, towards a more environmentally friendly future without sacrificing growth in, in fact you can make the argument that it should be quite good for economic growth the the, you know, the reinvestment the new investment that we'll see in in net zero Thank you, David. And talking about um, sort of the labour force there, a question from Bob Frost, who is the chairman of ARCA Group, 
Um, Bob writes, everyone from every country I've spoken to recently is reporting labour shortages. Where have all the workers gone? Yeah, it's a very good question, Bob. Uh, it's, you know, I remember a few, um, a few months ago, I had to go to um, uh, Amsterdam and the, um, and I left, I left from, um, uh, I'm sure I went from Gatwick and Gatwick was experiencing uh, shortages, but they were as nothing compared with the situation at, at Schiphol where they were short of every, everybody, you know, kind of um, passport inspectors, luggage people and so on uh, fortunately i didn't have any luggage to unload i only, only went to the day but uh, but it was it was chaotic there more chaotic and and the people i spoke to there said you know you can't get anybody these days i think what you know where have all the people gone well the uk is not the uk is somewhat unusual in the sense that we are the only major economy which has not got employment back to pre-pandemic levels because our workforce seems to have shrunk by more and if I, if I take the UK as an example, we are, you know, where's it gone? People have left the workforce because of ill health, you know, and mainly not long COVID, you know, other health problems, you know, and if you've got, if you've got a, a waiting list of 7 million for treatments on the, uh, on the NHS, maybe that's, that helps explain it. But a lot of people, you know, it was a, the pandemic was a moment. And I think that that's probably true of other countries as well, where they could, where people, you know, reconsider their lives, do I still do I still want to go back to the um, to the grind? Do I want to go ever go back to commuting? You know, having having tasted perhaps the freedom of working from home, they thought, well, um, I quite like being at home, and I, but I, I'd like to get rid of the working bit. You know, so I think people people re, re, reassess their lives. I think, yeah, and if you look at the um, if you look at the surveys that the ONS and others have done on this, it does look as though. Some of those people, particularly people in the 50 to 59 age group, are, are persuadable back, you know, if, uh, if employers are able to offer the right kind of jobs, the right kind of flexibility, that people will come back to work. So they're not lost forever, but the longer they are out of the labour force, the more, the bigger the problem it is. So, um, so I, think, I think it was that kind of, you know, a big sh shock, a big health shock like the pandemic just you know it was great for a lot of people because they could experience different things you could be furloughed and work with someone else but for others this was a moment where they said well do I want to go back to the life I had before and many decided not so I think I think that I think that is true in other countries as well thanks David a question here from um, Philip Busby in the chat box why is the rate of inflation in the UK higher than across Western Europe and most of the G7 is it entirely due to trustonomics? Uh, yeah, it's only. It's, I don't think we're quite at, um, at the levels of um, um, some other countries in Europe at the moment. I, you know, we're 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 close to that. I mean, the um, the answer to um, to the question is that we, we've got a higher inflation rate than, um, say, for example, France, because France was able to um, impose much more of a restriction on energy price rises. Mainly because the you know the French government pretty well owns EDF, which is one of the uh, the big suppliers. So they could they could take they they bef long before um, the interventions that we saw here, they could they could essentially take the energy price rises onto the government balance sheet. Um, America has um, lower inflation, you know, and then we just had a uh, quite a, an unexpectedly big drop in U.S. inflation because they weren't as sensitive to wholesale gas prices as we are you know the if uh, you know the the gas that is fracked in the US is not sold at international prices and as you will all know even though gasoline prices petrol prices have gone up in uh, in America they they're a fraction of what we would pay in most in most European countries so we're a bit higher than than, than most countries a bit above the eurozone and eu averages now but we're suffering the same experience in general. And um, I think the test will come when we move beyond these peaks and you know, how far does inflation fall after that? The, um, the other thing I would say on that question is that we, are, you know, we've, um, we do have, where, where our, our slight disadvantage is, is most clear is on, as I mentioned, you know, one of the few countries not to have employment back, uh, overall employment back above pre-pandemic levels. And also, Although we're close to it, not to have the economy back above uh, pre-pandemic levels, you know, we are we are the only country I think in the uh, in the G7 where 
GDP is still slightly lower than it was before the uh, before the pandemic. So, but not so much inflation. I don't think everybody is suffering from high inflation at the moment. Um, David, we've we've had a lot of questions about Brexit. Um, people asking that you know there should have been long, long enough now to get a sense of whether Brexit is working for UK or not, regardless of the pandemic and what's happening in in Russia and Ukraine. What, what, what's your what's your take on Brexit. Has there been a Brexit dividend for the UK or 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 did we make a mistake? Uh, well, you'd, you'd expect, you know, I I, um, uh, I would, having written about quite a lot of this before the referendum, uh, and I'm glad to say having uh, not been proved wrong by this. I mean, one of the things I I wrote before the um, referendum was that if we if we voted to leave, it would damage investment. It would damage investment by domestic firms and damage investment, foreign, foreign direct investment, because once you leave the single market, you become much less attractive to, you know, international businesses, because, you know, one of the one of the big reasons, there are many reasons for investing in the UK, but one of the, one of the reasons was to access the single market from a country which had the English language, which had a flexible labour market and, all, and, and other advantages. And both of those things have happened. So business investment stopped growing uh, after uh, roughly, you know, just about precisely at the time of the 2016 referendum, foreign direct investment we've fallen behind other countries in Europe since the uh, since the referendum, and our growth has suffered. You know, we are, um, you know, we have we have grown uh, more slowly. We were we were all used to growing as an EU member, growing faster than the EU average, and certainly growing faster than the eurozone, which we used to regard as a slow growth area. Since the uh, since 2016, UK economy has grown cumulatively by about 6.3%. Uh, the eurozone has grown over that period by 8.7%, and the EU as a whole has grown by 10.4%. EU, EU excluding UK. So um, we have, you know, we've gone from growth leader in the uh, in the EU to growth laggard. You know, we've grown. You know, people always say, well, we've grown a bit faster than than Germany over that period, which is true. But you know, for for the for the period from the early 90s to 2016 we grew twice as fast as germany we grew you know one and a half times as fast as france we grew five times as fast as italy and we've lost that advantage even in even in respect to those those big economies so i think it is going as 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 people expected what i always encounter from uh, you know strong supporters of brexit is um is that the, you know it's they will they will always say well you can't do those comparisons because of the pandemic you can't do those comparisons because of Russia Ukraine and so on you can because all countries are affected by it so so I think it's um, it's not going well there was a story around today that um, you know even Fortnum and Mason is stop selling stop stop selling uh, is stopping selling to the um, to the EU in common with many other businesses you know and I think that the real uh, problem the real worry for me is that lots of SMEs, lots, lots of smaller companies used to use the EU as their kind of stepping stone to becoming exporters. And many of those, perhaps 40% of SMEs who used to export, don't export anymore because it's such a hassle to sell into the EU. So, you know, it's water under the bridge, but I, so I would hope that one of the things we will get from a, a more realistic, you know, less ideological prime minister, and maybe from a change of government, if we get a change of government, is that we have to improve on the very poor and thin trade deal we've got with uh, with the EU. Um, the former uh, you know, agriculture and environment minister George Eustace admitted the other day that, having insisted that the trade deal we got with Australia was was a great one, it was actually pretty poor. He could say now he was out of office, and I think anybody looking realistically at the trade deal we got with the EU would say that it's. It's extremely thin. It's gossamer thin, and we need something better than that. You know, they're, they're still our main trading partner, but it would help if they we were able to trade more easily uh, with them. Thank you, David. We've got five minutes left. Um, probably get in a couple more couple more questions if we can. Um, the question, sort of close to your area, um, both economics and and the press, um, from Tim uh, Fevia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, who works at Specsavers. He's executive reward director. How much of a role do you think dramatic press coverage has played in exacerbating recent UK economic events? 
Uh, well, thank you, Tim. I, I, I think sometimes, you know, if I, I've always thought that if you were um, if you were a, a political novelist, you couldn't you couldn't have um, have um, invented a plot uh, that was would be quite as as um, as unexpected as the one we've seen. You know, so December 2019, Boris Johnson gets elected with a um, an 80 seat majority. Everybody says, you know, Labour has its worst worst results since the 1930s, and everybody says, well, he's going to be prime minister for 10 years or more, and um, and uh, Labour is out of power for maybe forever. You know, it's uh, it's uh, and then and then we see the kind of events that we've had, and and we see the uh, you know the, what we've been talking about, the uh, trust quoting mini budget. Nobody would have tried to invent that because it was so unprecedented. The the reaction to it so. I think we, you know, we we don't look gift horses in the mouth in the mouth in in the in the press. Uh, if there's drama, we will report it. But too often, I think we, uh, you know, if 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 the if the genuine drama isn't there, if it's unrealistic, and the papers still try to to manufacture a crisis out of a um, out of something that isn't a crisis, then that that soon falls away. I don't, but when it is a real crisis, as it was um, recently. Then I think we have no obligation but to uh, to report report it. And you know, sometimes you wonder whether you've got enough adjectives in the vocabulary to 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 report it. So I, I you know, I uh, so and I think the, the Tim, I would say to you one thing is is that um, scale is also important. That when we uh, you know when people start talking, as I'm sure they will after tomorrow's autumn statement about about recession again and austerity, just think about you know. The magnitudes. I mean, if you if you have a recession in which GDP falls by half percent for a couple of consecutive quarters, then that is very different from the one I was describing to you earlier, when it fell by nineteen and a half percent in a single quarter. You know, so scale is important. And I think some of my colleagues on newspapers and on the broadcast media don't distinguish enough between mild and severe. You know, so so recession gets the headlines, even if it's a fall of 0.1 percent, and um, you know, so I think sometimes there's not enough discrimination in that respect. Thank you, David. Um, last question. I think about two minutes left. A uh, question here from Stephen Turpey. He is the chairman of Bright Stars. He writes, in chaos, there is always opportunity. In your opinion, David, what are the fundamental opportunities for British businesses? Yeah, I think I think I think that's absolutely right. And I, I think one of the um, one of the things that um, you know, moving to you know, you could argue that um, when interest rates were um, were kept low for that very long time, after the financial crisis and through the pandemic, then that enabled lots of businesses which weren't all that good to uh, to continue. You know, I don't want to disparage them by calling them zombie businesses, but some people would. I think the um, you know, when we move to into more challenging times. I think that does sort out the wheat from the chaff it, and the you know good businesses will always survive and know how to survive and know how to plan in in more challenging times others will fall by the wayside and you know we're seeing you know even very recently you know businesses that you know not so long ago were stars of their sector you know, having to go into administration and so on you know I, I won't mention the names but you 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 know the ones I mean and um but good businesses will see opportunities there, and already, you know, as those as those become casualties, others are seeing opportunities to buy up their names or buy up their, uh, you know, buy, buy up their uh, uh, their reputations, uh, the, the good part of their reputation. So I think there will be opportunities, and and it's you know, economists would call this kind of creative destruction. That once you you know you get a difficult time, some fall by the wayside. But other opportunities arise, and you know phoenixes do rise from these ashes. So, so that is the uh, that is the thing I would say. But it is a, it is a very good point to make, I think, and I, I think we may see more of that now than we've seen, perhaps for the last ten or twelve years. Thank you, David. Um, the, the clock has beaten us. We're we're, we're dead on two p.m. Um, thank you again, David, for your wisdom and expertise. Um, always a always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, I'm reliably informed this is our most attended webinar ever. Um, so thank you um, to everyone for dialing in and watching today. Um, David is going to produce a blog, which we will post so you can read 
um, his summary and comments. Um, thank you again, David. Thank you again for dialing in. And we will see you all again very soon. Thank you.